Well, we're speaking here to Marion Harkin, MEP for a Northwest constituency in Ireland, and um, very grateful that you're going to participate in Politics Talk, Marion, and appreciate that you've given us the time here today to interview you. Um, Marion, I suppose I'd focus firstly on, on, on an issue which occurs to a lot of Irish people uh, in the wake of the parliamentary elections earlier this year, but, and it's just exactly what do our parliamentarians do? And uh, I suppose I'd put to you, I mean, what would you consider your achievements from your previous term in office? And then perhaps could you turn to, to your focus for, for the current term? Well, I suppose my work can be divided, I often think, in, in three. First of all, my parliamentary work at home, mm -hmm. uh, where people are contacting my office, I have a full-time office, mm -hmm. and with various issues. One of the things I notice in recent years in particular is more and more of those issues are European, mm -hmm. and often to do with people either doing business abroad, buying abroad, or buying property abroad. It, it's to do with the fact that we're in the EU, and I see there's more and more of that. So that's, that's one part part of it if you like. The second part would be what I would call my committee work here. Mm -hmm. My main committee, Employment and Social Affairs. Mm -hmm. I'm also on Agriculture and Petitions as a substitute. Mm -hmm. So all of that legislation and we'll talk about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And then my third sector if you like is the other areas that I'm involved in out here. Mm -hmm. Like for example volunteering, carers, uh, the cancer groups I'm involved in out here, mm -hmm. that those are the niches, if you like, that I've found at European level where I can connect mm -hmm. with Irish people at home. But let me just give you maybe one example of work I'm doing now mm -hmm. that is directly connected to what's happening in Ireland. Sure. We've most people have heard of the Dell application for the Globalisation Fund and indeed both SR Technics and Waterford Glass have applied mm -hmm. as well. However, because I'm the only Irish member on that working group and because we've been going through the applications for the last months and months, mm -hmm. I, I have discovered that it doesn't need to be one big firm that, that closes down and hundreds or thousands made redundant. Sure. If there is any sector where uh, 500 workers are made redundant in nine months, then you can apply for the Globalisation Fund. So as we speak, the Regional Assembly for the BMW, the Border Midlands mm -hmm. and West, collecting figures in the pharmaceutical sector, mm -hmm. in various other sectors, the construction sector mm -hmm. as well, to see if we can apply. So it was because of my work in that committee, and unfortunately because of what's happening at home, that I'm able to link the two, and hopefully there may be some light at the end of the tunnel for, for people who have been unfortunate enough to lose their jobs. That's very good. So I suppose uh, that will be the sort of the the issues which are occupying your time at the moment. And looking at your committee work, I, I noticed you mentioned your involvement as a substitute on the agricultural committee. Uh, agriculture, as you well know from from your constituents, I'm sure, is is forming a it's coming into a real. Uh, highlighted kind of topic at the moment, mm -hmm. given uh, issues surrounding budgets, future expenditure, um, and obviously it's, a, it's an issue which is very close to, to Irish hearts anyway. Um, how do you see the future of the cap? Do you feel that it's going to be threatened? At present it obviously occupies a significant amount of proportion of the European budget. Yes. Do you think it's likely to be undermined going forward, and uh, where do you see this going? I think there's a very tough battle ahead. I think the, the budget certainly will not increase. There will be a very tough battle to maintain it where it is sure. and the likelihood is that it may decrease. Obviously the Agriculture Committee and those who are supporting the, that whole area yeah. would, would have very, very strong concerns about it but that's what we're looking at. Mm. We're looking at other sectors like for example research and development which is also very, very important for Ireland. Sure. Um, they looking for a bigger slice of the cake. Mm. So in the longer term that is that is the major issue facing agriculture but also there's the whole issue of agriculture and climate change and of course the uh, WTO talks so a lot of really major issues coming down the track for Irish agriculture but equally there there are the the day-to-day -day issues that affect farmers and just today in the petitions committee this afternoon mm -hmm. there's a group of farmers from Scotland who have mm -hmm. a petition in on uh, tagging electronic tagging of sheep now mm -hmm. that obviously rings a lot of bells with Irish farmers mm -hmm. at home so we'll see how that one goes so you've got the the immediate and then you've got the longer term but certainly the the major issues for, for Irish agriculture at the moment is number one the budget the single farm payment how that will pan out number two agriculture and climate change and, mm -hmm. and how um, you know, changes there will, will impact 
on agriculture sure. and then issues like for example food labeling so that consumers know exactly what they're buying i mean that's a major issue for many mm-hmm. irish producers for example uh, people who produce chickens in in part of my constituency let's say the areas like um monaghan cavan mm-hmm. etc chicken growers there i mean they have to compete with one ton blocks of frozen chicken coming in from Brazil Mm -hmm. that's defrosted maybe in Antwerp or somewhere Mm -hmm. a few breadcrumbs thrown on it and then it's labelled as EU because of course it was processed in the EU. Mm -hmm. So those are the day to day issues that farmers are facing and in fact just last week in Strasbourg we had a very late night debate for anybody who was interested between Mm -hmm. 11 and 12 o'clock at night on the whole issue of Brazilian beef Mm -hmm. and for anybody interested in that it would be worthwhile going to the Parliament website because one after the other speakers not just from Ireland and the UK, which is very much affected, but right across the EU, 90% of all of the speakers in the Parliament were very critical of the European Commission and the whole issue of Brazilian beef. And of course, that was really highlighted by the IFA and the Farmers' Journal. Mm. So, you know, what people say and do does matter. Mm. I mean, you've identified a number of issues that are of immediate concern to Irish citizens. And I, I suppose I would focus on whether our voice is being adequately heard, um, particularly in the context of our initial rejection of the Lisbon Treaty in, La- uh, in 2008 and, of course, our approval in Octo- on October 2nd. I wonder, do you believe that, the, that Ireland's representation or Ireland's voice is in any way affected or undermined by virtue of the fact that we have perhaps come across as bad Europeans? Uh, do you think that when it comes to representing Irish interests, as I've outlined, that we're in any way undermined here in the Parliament? Well, it's interesting you should ask that question on the 1st of December, when, of course, is the day that the Lisbon Treaty is being finally ratified. Do I think that our position has been undermined? I think in the Parliament, no. Certainly, uh, when Ireland voted no, there were some people who were were critical enough, but but not many, because the truth of the matter is that the the French and the Dutch and the the British MEPs and many others realised that they would have a difficulty in getting it through. I mean, obviously, the Spanish voted yes and others as well. But um, MEPs are very pragmatic people because they're politicians and they know the reality of the situation. Um, I think myself uh, that once the Lisbon Treaty was explained better to people, that people had a better grasp of the situation and that for that and because of our economic situation, I think that played a role also, people decided that yes was the better vote. And in fact, that was the way I canvassed for uh, Lisbon. I couldn't say it to people yes is the best vote but what I could say is that from having read the treaty from having studied it and asked the questions yes was the better vote it was the better choice to make in the circumstances uh, and, and that would be still my view of it so I would I, I think maybe within certain uh, sectors th- there might have been a bit of anger perhaps maybe within the commission I heard that from uh, people who work there sure. but in general that they, they were that was just down to individuals it, you know annoyance whatever mm-hmm. that kind of thing as I said I think most politicians are very pragmatic and understand mm-hmm. uh, that um, for any citizen any ordinary average person to have an understanding of what's in the Lisbon Treaty and then to make a decision on it is asking a lot mm-hmm. and we asked a lot mm-hmm. and what we asked people to do was we asked them to put their faith in us and in the institutions and all of us know that if there's one thing people are losing faith in it's institutions mm-hmm. and I think actually it was a, a remarkable result from Ireland. Mm-hmm. I mean, you use a very interesting word, which is faith. Uh, One could argue that it's almost derivative of something from religion. And this is something which we would focus on. I mean, is there a proper communication of the ins and outs of the institutions, even on a very basic level, so that a decision by a European citizen is more than just an act of faith or a leap of faith, but an informed decision? I mean, what kind of proposals or steps would you suggest ought to be taken when it comes to driving up interest amongst citizens, obviously Irish citizens, but right across the community, at the union rather, um, when it comes to, for example, would, would one idea be to improve school programmes or are there other steps, for example, for example, maybe holding European elections at the same time as, as national ones, what kind of steps would you take when it comes to informing citizens and making sure that there's a degree of understanding well, I always say that people are concerned with what concerns themselves. That's that's true for all of us. And let's look at what's concerning Irish people at the moment. The floods, for example. I mean, one of the first questions people will ask me is, 
you know, it, what's the possibility of this, any funding, the EU solidarity fund in the case of the floods? And while it's it's a small proportion of, of what what the, the extent of the damage, nonetheless, um, that will ring bells with people. I also spoke about the globalisation fund for those that are being made redundant at the moment. Mm. If you look at the bigger picture, we have the European Investment Bank, which incidentally is the biggest bank in the world. It's bigger than the World Bank, the IMF, and most people don't realise that. And that's certainly loaning money to Irish banks and, and propping up our, our system, if you like, at the moment. So people in different areas have different interests and I think it is the job largely of parliamentarians but also of the European Commission and Parliament Office in Dublin to try to connect with people on issues that they're concerned with. For example, I had four senior volunteers uh, in the Parliament uh, the week before last. Mm -hmm. But there was um, a seminar on senior volunteering. Mm -hmm. And you, you asked about schools and, and various programs. Mm -hmm. uh, there are programs for senior volunteers. There are programs for younger people who volunteer. There are school programs, etc. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I have a group, a uh, Faroiga group, uh, coming to the Parliament next week. And it, again, that's uh, partly subsidised by the EU mm -hmm. so that they get some sense of, of the workings of the EU. So I, I think that politicians have to be far more proactive. But I do think it is totally unreasonable to expect every Irish person to know everything that goes on in the EU. Yes. But what is reasonable is that they would have an interest in issues that affect them at that particular time. And it's important to get that message through. And one of the things I do regularly is I, I go to schools. I talk to I talk to fifth class students. Mm -hmm. I talk to transition years. I don't yeah. just talk to those who are going to have a vote in a year or two. Sure. I do primary as well as secondary. Mm -hmm. So they can put a face to the name and they get a sense that I'm not just some some suit out in Brussels mm -hmm. and that uh, you know that there is a connection but I remember I think I, I forget now who said it but I remember the comment being made that nobody ever reads the finance bill and nobody really knows what's in it mm -hmm. so in that sense you can't expect Irish people to know exactly what's going on here but what you can expect and, and as I said, I believe it's largely the job of politicians is to ensure that those who have a particular interest are informed about what is going on. I suppose finally I would just turn to uh, criticisms that might be made of the Parliament and the workings of the Parliament. If you had to make one particular criticism, which is a healthy thing to do I suppose, oh, when it comes to remedying uh, issues or problems in any institution, what one criticism would you identify with the way the Parliament carries out its business? Well, one of the things I think needs to be changed is the whole register of lobbyists. At the moment, that's voluntary. Mm -hmm. And people will say, well, how do I know who's influencing you when you're making a decision? How do I know who has your ear? Mm -hmm. And the only way you can know that is if all of the people who lobby the parliament, from the smallest little NGO or voluntary group to the largest corporation like Microsoft, mm -hmm. All of that needs to be in the public domain. And if Europe is to have any chance of succeeding as an ideal, there must be at all times transparency and openness. Now, I know people are sick listening to those words and say, what do they mean? What they mean is that the workings of whether it be the committees or the European Council, when it's taking its decisions, or the people who lobby the Commission or the MEPs about specific issues, that that should be available in the public domain. Sure. There is also another area which I think just isn't finally fully finalised and, and needs to be, and that's the whole area of MEPs and their allowances and their expenses. I honestly believe that the allowances, I mean, they are actually in the public domain at this stage, but whatever expenses MEPs have for travel or whatever, the Parliament should make those available on a year-by-year -year basis. Mm -hmm. You, you, the, the expenses are, depending on the cost of your flights, whatever, and for sure. your travel, etc., they're for doing your job. And once something like that isn't in the public domain, people rightly say, well, why? What's the reason it's not in the public domain? Mm -hmm. And even if there's nothing wrong and and hopefully in most cases there aren't mm -hmm. of course there were uh, various practices uncovered a year or two ago mm -hmm. by certain MEPs with their um, 
the money they had for employing staff and and that just shouldn't go on and i think the only way to ensure it doesn't go on is if they're in the public domain like not exactly what i pay each of my staff but the total amount and let's say the number of staff i have or something like that so that people if they have a question the answer is easily available for them because i come back to the issue that this whole institution i believe can only survive in the longer term mm-hmm. if there is full and complete and total access to information. Now, there's lots of other things it needs to do to succeed. I mean, that's only one of them, sure. but you asked me for one. That's very good. Well, Marion, thank you very much for agreeing to participate in with Politics Talk, and I wish you the very best for the rest of your thank term. You. Thank you.